Okay. Um, I'm Harvey Dellery, and I got Abhishek here with me as well. We work for CMX. We're part of the engineering team there. Um, what we're going to do is, is we'll go through both. We'll give you a little bit of overview of CMX, and then what we'll do is we'll start with the REST APIs, and then we'll go more in depth also into the mobile SDK we have as well. Um, so basically, that's the agenda. And then I'll go over some use cases as well. And some of these are the use cases I'll go over are actually live use cases we've actually done in an experience lab we have back in San Jose. So just to go over an introduction, what is CMX? CMX has, is basically sort of like wife indoor location, and it leverage, uses Wi-Fi in order to do that. So what does that give us the ability to do? We can detect the clients. We can detect them in the sense that they can either associate, we can detect them that way, or not even joining a Wi-Fi, basically a mobile device or some end Wi-Fi device will send probes periodically in order to figure out Wi-Fi's to join, hidden Wi-Fi's. And by based on those probes as well, we can actually detect those as well. But not only can we detect your normal mobile devices, et cetera, we actually have the capability to detect BLE devices. For example, we can see beacons. That's one of the 10.0 features we have. We can see beacons, where they're located, give you your UID, major, minor information as well. So there's the detection factor. There's the connect, which is the ability then to connect those users onto the network. And what we do is we have a get, nice, very nice guest portal that allows you to come in th either through social or custom portals. And basically, you can then join the Wi-Fi through there. And then finally, the Engage, which is the app mobile experience that we have here. Then when you combine all of this information together, you can then leverage and create analytics information. So how does CMX work? So again, you have your mobile devices. Either they're joined or they're pinging out at a certain rate. And that's where we get the probing. Or if they're connected with our fast locate APs, we can do it through data RSSI. Um, we actually have new APs you can see in the world of solution, which we use what we call angle of arrival, and that can basically also basically de determine an AP's location. doesn't use RSSI in that case. It's actually using the angle of the arrival of the packets. But the same concept is the same, where basically that information is passed up to the controller. In the case of RSSI, the controller will mulch, mulch some information. But at the end, it's the MSC or CMX that basically processes this information and basically determines your location of the device. Then once it has that information, it can then send that information out. Now we can send it out through what we call a notification receiver, so there's basically a northbound notification, or you can query for that information through REST APIs, and then later I'll actually show you the mobile SDK as well. So the topology is basically the following. You got your bottom layer, which are your Wi-Fi clients. APs are the, basically the layer in between, and that's basically the devices that are detecting all these clients. And basically, in the world of control and Cisco APs and everything, it all goes to a controller. The controller today can, also, can do things such as configuration from a central point. So I can have hundreds of basically APs, all of them controlled from one controller, but it also acts as a place to aggregate information about location, which is what we do here. And then from there, it goes up to the MSC. Now, you typically you have a prime on a large scale deployment managing these, but, and then prime has its own maps and information about what layering and the locations of everything, and we pull from there. And then basically, once it's processed through the MSC, we can send it out to notification receivers, or in the case of the uh, mobile SDK, a mobile app server. So now just a little bit of a history of location. Basically, we started out with GPS location. And then what happened is, is Cisco basically started to do RSSI triangulation with the Aeronet APs. And basically, what you're seeing now is the RSSI first generation. And that's basically sort of like a reverse GPS, where the APs are figuring out multiple APs, figure out where you see you. And from there, we can then triangulate your location. Then what we did is the improved with Fast Locate. Now, Fast Locate was introduced basically a while ago. 
And what that does is it doesn't just use the probes, in fact, it uses the data packets now. So in the case, in this case, we do require that you be associated to the AP, but once you're associated, those data packets are being used in order to determine your location. So now we can determine your location faster because one of the downsides of probes, it could be very infrequent. So depending upon the device, the OS, power levels on the device, you're talking 20 seconds, 40 seconds, even longer for a normal probe. But with data, you're talking a lot more frequent, basically refresh. And then basically now we have the advent of BLE, so we can actually do BLE detection and information based upon that. And then finally, the technology you can actually see in the world of solutions downstairs is we actually have four different hyperlocation APs located there. And then you can see basically, based upon these APs, you can see the angle of arrival. And basically what we did is we have a phone on the desk and it's really nailing where the phone is. And as the phone moves, it can actually see that location movement from there. So, <clears throat> spotlight, what's basically understanding where the technology's evolved. So originally we have fast locate, we do then hyperlocation, we're coming BLE aware. What we've done in 10.0 is we've created role-based, a better workflow. Um, we do, like I said, BLE is being introduced. Video analytics is something we're looking at. Verticalization is another thing. And then all this is the scaling of the MSC 10.0 is significantly improved over the 8.0 releases. Three times scaling, we're creating a clustering model. The latency is now significantly improved. Uh, we're go now typically you see a two second latency, whereas in the past it was maybe five, six, eight seconds or more. Um, so basically location accuracy, like I said before, <laughs> with before with our normal RSSI, you're looking at five to seven meters. With angle of arrival, we're looking at sub one meter. Before, it was one to two updates per minute, again, based upon the probing, but now with all the new fast located in the angle of arrival, we're talking 10 to 120 updates per minute. Before, the latency was 10 to 20. Now we're talking two to four seconds. So we can better understand customer behavior, identify their patterns, and gain real insight into everything. So now that we can do that, how do we leverage that through the APIs? So we have several different APIs, like I mentioned. The first of which we'll go through is the REST APIs. So it's basically your typical REST model, where we basically can get information, not only, again, about just the devices, but smartphones, Wi-Fi tags, laptops, printers, anything Wi-Fi, even the beacons, Bluetooth sensors, wireless video cameras, et cetera, can be detected. And they can be detected in a sense that they can be basically considered roads. Um, for example, video cameras are a common rogue or something at times. <coughs> so the REST APIs um, uses the typical HTTPS, uh, the gives get, post, put, and delete methods. That's what we typically have. The data formatted out is JSON. Uh, we do basic auth, and I'll go through that in a second, but basic auth is the principle where we do the authentication in. So how are the, basically the REST API segmented? I, cr I like the four boxes still, and the, the documentation is a little bit different now, but I still like them to categorize them like this. What we have is a real-time location, which means tell me where everything is at this current time and position. We have basically what we have is configuration-related APIs. That's like give me the map information, and the, ma the map info is really nice in the sense that I can request the map, get the floor dimensions, I can get the location of all the APs placed on the floor, I can get uh, the map itself. So all that information can be pulled out from the configuration. We have the history, so not only can I look at what's current, I can go back and replay a client's movement over time. So I can see as a client moves through the building, up and down maybe to another floor, et cetera, and see all that through the history APIs. And then we have the notification APIs. So normally you could do the REST APIs, which is a query and response type of mechanism, but in the notifications, I can now sit there and have the not information pushed to me. 
and there's different types of notifications you can register for, and you can filter it out as well, too. So say you only wanted to listen for certain notifications about certain clients, you can do that here as well. So authentication is the, the most common problem we have with, with people first starting out. Um, so basically, it is a base 64. The way we, if you're going to build it in your own source code, you use a username, colon, password, and then basically you would encode that into that. Um, it's basic, and then basically this sort of gives you an example of how you do it in Postman. You'd click the basic auth, and it would fill in like this. With the new documentation, we actually give you several examples of how to do this in Python, JavaScript, Java, and all that different tech, uh, languages, so that now you can do it with using those languages. The data format is JSON, as, as far as the default, and this is just a simple example of how it comes back. And then finally, the newest thing what we, what we really like is the documentation. We've spent a good amount of time improving the documentation here. Um, if you go to whatever server you may have, and then you click API Docs, you'll get something like this. And what's nice about this is we've broken everything up into categories. We've given you a way to click code, and you can get sample code as far as how to do the simple things of authenticating and doing the rest APIs. And then we have way, links to get to DevNet and CMX. Um, we actually have a sandbox on DevNet, so you can try this out as well. We have it in the learning labs as well. We have an 8.0 version, a 10.0, and an SDK version. You can try out all in DevNet. So what we really like about the new documentation is you can go straight into the documentation, read about it, and then try it right from the documentation. So at the top, when I go drill down into the code, and into the actual APIs, I can actually enter the username and the password. And then if it requires parameters, fill those in and then click the Try It Now button. And what's nice is it'll actually then tell you what you called, the response code, give you some header, and then give you the body information. So it's a nice, easy way to get going and try it out and see what you should expect as response. So sample code. Like I said, again, we have a link to the sample code. And you can see on the right, we've got Python, Java, and Node.js. We've given you ways to do it through REST APIs. And we've also given you example code on how to handle and be a receiver as well as a northbound receiver. And you can see, basically, in this case, you can see the basic auth. And we'll take you through on far as how to enter it in and do the authentication. Now, configuration APIs. I've broken it into the, th the most important three I've listed here are the alerts, the maps, and the history alerts. So the map resource APIs. So these are the ones where you can get information about the map. So if I did the first line up there, I'd get everything about the map we pretty much have. That includes the campus, the buildings, the floors, the dimensions of the buildings, if it has GPS markers, it'll get the GPS information, AP placement, uh, height of the building, I mean, everything we can think of. It's, if you, that's the full thing. Now, if you wanted to drill down to specific building or floor or something like that, you can just basically use the maps info URL and then drill down that way instead of getting all the maps information. The other thing is getting the map images. So you can actually pull out the same image we're using. And to do that, there's two different ways. You can give it the basically hierarchy, which is the campus, the building, and the floor. If you know that information, you can just put it in the URL there. If you, in the map info, there is an actual image name. So if you actually wanted to go and just pull out using the image name, you can do that as well. And that's a quick way of doing it as well. So this is the following as an example of me pulling out a basically a map image. And you can see at the top, I, I pulled out based on the, the campus, Nortec campus, the building Nortec-1, and then in the first floor in this case. 
by just doing that URL and authenticating, I actually get the raw image that we have basically in the MSC. And then what you can do is leverage that for your own mapping capabilities if you want. As far as the map info, again, this includes the dimensions of the building. It includes basically the ID information. If we had GPS markers, it would be in there. If you had defined zones, you would see those as well. Access points, the image itself being used basically here. So again, remember I said image name. That's basically this image name right there. Uh, the width, the height, the resolution, and again, the dimensions and so forth are all within that. So the location APIs. So again, we have ways of, for doing location. It's not only based upon clients. It can include rogue APs, beacons, which is what we introduced in 10, tags. We got rogue clients. And then you got client history and active clients, which are your typical ones we'll show. So the more the ones that we typically see users using in the hackathons and so forth are the active client APIs. So from the REST APIs, if I gave it the top URL, I'd get all the clients that were basically being tracked by the MSC. Now, if I wanted to drill down to a specific client, I can do that in a 10 dot later release. I can do it by IP address, MAC, or if they're authenticated using the uh, 802.1x, I can use username. So again, this is an example of the MAC format. I can do IP address and then a username. Now, note for this, this works well, but for history, we won't basically use uh, IP address because that changes over time through history. Uh, the other one that we typically see used is to get the client count currently. Uh, client location, again, this is the information that's returned back when I initiate a client location request. So at the top, I have the MAC address of the client I just retrieved. I have the map information where it's located currently in this case because it's an active client. I have the map coordinates. And then if it is associated, I will get information about the IP address. I'll get the SSID. I'll get the band it's on, the AP MAC, and, all, and even the byte sent, received, and so forth. So I get a lot of detailed information about that client. Client history, so again, this is now I can go back in time, get the information about a client. So I can get the history of all clients, which is very substantial, or at least I can at least filter down to the MAC address. And then in that case, I'd get the history of that specific MAC. Um, it's basically the same as a regular client active one except this will be an array of course of over time. So what you'll see in the case of the history is you'll see the same information, but the timestamps and with the different map locations and other information like byte sense and received will all vary basically over the time that particular client was associated. Uh, beacon management, so I wanted to mention this as well. So we can, like I said before, we can detect eye beacons. We can see their position. We can get you information about the beacon, which includes the UUID, the major, and the minor. So this allows us to basically say if a beacon is in the spot it's supposed to be. If a beacon moves, we can actually let, notify you that that beacon's moved outside some, some dimensions. If the beacon disappears as well, we can notify you that as well. So it's a way of basically tracking those beacons. So again, you can get a complete list of beacons. You can go to a specific beacon based upon a MAC address. You could delete it out. You could update the beacon information that we have in there, such that maybe the SSID or the major or minor change. You can update that information. You can replace it basically with another beacon info as well. So beacon location. So this is some of the information we returned back. So again, I wanted to point out some different things. Type known, meaning in, in the, on the R maps in, within t, uh, CMX, you can say this is a known beacon, and you can mark the spot you think where it should be. 
So in this case, this is a known beacon because I've actually marked it as a known, because it's not a rogue, because if I don't mark it as known, we can treat it as a rogue beacon. And then I can say, right now, the status of this particular beacon is it's misplaced. So somehow this beacon's moved to a different location. Could be somebody accidentally moved it, could be somebody's walking out with it, and then that's why we detected the movement, it's, being, it's leaving the vicinity. The other thing is, is we have the UUID, the major and the minor for the beacon. We have the detected location. And what's nice, like I said, is we have the configured location. So you can basically specify where it should have been located and then basically we'll tell you where it should have been located versus where it really is located. So in this case, it's gone so far out of the range of the X and Y it's still on the first floor, but you can see the X and Y differentiate enough that I, we think it's left the vicinity. Uh, connect. So again, we have our guest access solution. So that's the ability to have someone come in as a guest, either through a custom portal, or they can integrate, they can come in and do like Facebook. They can check in through Facebook or some other way, like some socials like that. And what this allows us to do is get information about users that have come on and, and basically logged in through Connect. So you can get a list of users. And you can get information about how that user came in. So basically you can get information about the location, the portal, for example, you can have multiple portals depending upon SSID, um, so in this case, he came in through a portal called Shop. The type of portal being used, was it a custom portal, was it a Facebook portal, something like that. And then you can get information about the client, for example, the agent, again, the bytes, the email, so forth, all that information that was put in there. So all that can be retrieved through the REST API. Um, analytics APIs are somewhat new too, and they're still marked as beta. And what, what's nice about these is now you can do, like I said, we have analytics, we're doing analytics, and now you can pull that information out as well through our APIs. So you can retrieve the KPI information. So we have a bunch of KPIs, you can pull that list out. You can pick up a specific one, but what's nice is you know, I can also get dwell time for a given period, so I can see information about dwell times, or device count times for, again, a specific period. So I can go over and see how that information is based on our analytics. So in, this is an example of the KPI dump. So I can get information about notifications received, RSSI, mm -hmm. you can see basically from the KPIs I can get various levels of information about, okay, I've received on average 2.62, 15 minutes, so forth, total building dwell. So I've got my top building dwell times there. So in this case, Nortec 1 is my biggest one. So all that's from the KPI information we dump out. And then finally, the notification receivers. So this is, again, this way, this is the way for us to send you information in, in real time. So instead of having to poll for the information, you, you may want to react to certain clients' movement or certain clients joining, certain clients leaving a zone. You may want to take actions immediately upon that. So the way to do it is through the notifications. So we have ways to get a complete list of the current notifications. You can get them by name. You can add your own description, uh, notifications, delete or change the status. And so here's an example of, of basically adding a subscription. You can see I'm creating it. I'm look, what I'm doing in this case is I'm trying to listen for location updates. I'm telling it to send the, the location updates to the following URI. And once it does that information, I set the content type, I did a put. And then on a creation, you should get a 201, meaning it was created successfully. Now the type of notifications you can list for are absence, that's basically when someone disappears, beacon movements, again that's for our beacons, beacon absence. We have movements, which basically basically is a movement of a particular device. 
association, so when they actually join the Wi-Fi, you may want to take action on them. And the notifications look like the following. So this is basically a notification being sent. So in this case, it's a movement notification. My subscription name is Movement for Test. It is a wireless client. It's got the device ID. Uh, more importantly, it's got the map, the location coordinates. Confidence factor is a good thing. Um, and one of the things that we see is that sort of tells me how good we think this location is. So the bigger the number, the more likely we, it's not in that location possibly, or it's such a big bounded area that you may want to ignore it. So for example, we have some basically sometimes where we say if you're seeing a lot of jumping, what you may want to do is look at the confidence factor number and say, all right, I'm, not, I'm going to ignore some of the updates that are coming in. And there's different reasons why, depending upon your location, the walling, the infrastructure, the type of device, the RSI factors, the placement of the APs, all can reduce the confidence factor. So the REST APIs demo, let me just give you a quick demo of some of the APIs. Whoops. So one of the things I just wanted to point out was we do have a sandbox for you to try out. And you can try this out on DevNet. There's, there's three different sandboxes we have today, one for the older 8.0, one for the new 10.0, which is what I'm looking at here, and then one for what we call our mobile SDK. So again, in this, you can see basically what I've done is I did a REST call there. Let me do another, let me show you this one here. And in this one I will do, again, it's in the sandbox, and I'm looking for just the location client account, and I can do basically a send, and it'll give it, should be 80. My connect, yeah, connected to Wi-Fi. So 80 is our typical sandbox, basically the clients we have there. And so you can see it's basically JSON. And the authorization, when I built it, was just by entering basic auth and refreshing the header. Um, let me show you just quickly also the... the documentation here. Like I said, the documentation is a living doc in a sense. This is actually built out of our own code. If I go to the home here, so again, we broke it in into different categories. The maps and all those informations are maintained there. The location APIs are down below. So for example, if I wanted to actually try out a location API, so in this case, I've got learning, learning, which is the sandbox API uh, URL and password. And say I want to look for active clients and I want to try and get, let me get all the active clients. So we have the try it now button. So all I have to do, because it doesn't have any parameters, I can just click the try it button. So what it'll do is start to load that information in. And what's nice is I've got the header there. And then I've got the response body. So this is actual live REST call that's being done to the back end to retrieve this information. And then I can do is examine it, make sure if I do the same REST call using my program that I get the same information there formatted the same way. So it's a nice way to do that. So again, we have it in the DevNet zone. There's learning labs there. You can just try out at any station. All right, let me go back to the the mobile SDK. So, the mobile SDK. So you want me to do all this? Or? <laughs> um, it's part of the CMX Engage strategy. The mobile SDK is really just a find me way, a way to find my location for the device I'm running on in, in, for iOS and Android. We have REST APIs, but those 
don't basically aren't really a find me solution per se. Those are more for applications to use at the web services level. What's different about this than the REST APIs is we introduce a, a mobile app server. So the idea is instead of trying to query the MSCs and your infrastructure devices, we create what we call sort of a proxy server of the MSC. And it's designed to do a few things, and I'll go into that as much. But the mobile devices, when they're asking about their current location, they're querying the mobile app server for that location information. They're not talking to the MSC. So basically the devices are heard by the access points. The information is then propagated and managed up to the MSC. The mobile app server then is made aware of that. It's strictly a push, sort of like a push notification to him. So he never actually has to talk to the MSC directly. And what he can do is then get the request and handle them. He can actually then also do push notifications for the mobile device in a sense that, say I'm, I've created a store and if somebody enters a store, I want them to receive a text message. So basically you can do that through the, you know, the typical push notification of Gap, Google and Apple. So what are the components? So it's a little bit different in the sense that we just have an MSC. Like I said, we have a mobile app server and basically that's for handling the clients. It'll handle what we call registration. And what we do by registration is when, when a client first launches and it's never talked to the mobile app server, what we do is we're trying to create a secure way for them to talk to each other. So the idea is one mobile device can't figure out somebody else's mobile device's location. So basically we create a key hash between the two such that when I query from my location, I'm the only one getting that information. Um, we also address the iOS 7 MAC address issue because iOS doesn't allow you to retrieve the MAC address. So the way MSC works is again, the, uh, the APs are trying to figure out your location. So they figure out and they know your MAC address. So then as a device, I want to know my, MAC, my location. Well, I need to figure out what my MAC address is and we have a way of handling that by basically having the client associate one time at least, and based upon that association, we can then determine which device associated, what his MAC address is part of the associate. And again, we have the SDK, it's iOS and Android. It comes in really two sort of flavors. There's the core piece, which is just basically get me my X and Y, my longitude and latitude, so I can then query for that. But it also allows me, if I don't, we can, it can do map rendering as well. So it can draw the map for you, put the dot on the map. It can show you the points of interest. It can show you navigation routes, all that too as well as you want. That's more the UI aspect to it. But if you have your own UI, you, can, you don't need that. You can just use the core functionality. And then finally, the simulator. So obviously you saw how much the infrastructure I might need in order to test this out. But as a mobile app developer, I don't have that infrastructure currently. So what we did is we created a simulator which allows you then to do that sim environment without needing all that. Right now it can run on your laptop and as well as in the cloud. Good question. So, so the question was, what is the use case and who is it targeted to? So basically, it's anybody really needing indoor, wants the indoor location with Cisco gear. So we have retail customers, for example, that want to basically tell someone, you, either employee or maybe uh, someone, um, a customer, where to get to certain departments. Um, it could be hospitals, for example, who want to use this. So as I check in at the front desk, how do I know where to get to my radiology versus that? or I want to see where I'm at and then look at the map in my relative position. <clears throat> yes, you do need Cisco access points. We lead, we are number one in that market, so more likely if it's enterprise, it's ours. So, but it does require Cisco gear. Um, so why do you need the mo So the question we get a lot is, why do I need the CMX mobile SDK versus just, why don't I just use the REST APIs? So you can do that. You could go and try and build it yourself. But like I said, somewhat is the mobile app server is designed for the DMZ. 
We've already built it such that it can withstand a lot of notifications. So if you listen for notifications, you can get a substantial amount. Examples of this, we're getting 150 plus sec uh, events per second and not a large venue. So you can get a lot of movement, all the movements. As soon as you move about five to 10 feet, that's a notification. So this is a way we've already handled that. Um, it also only maintains the last location update. So worst case is, is we, don't, we don't have any history, we don't have anything like that. It's strictly where is that device at this particular time. Um, location requests are restricted per device. So uh, with the problem with the REST API is we don't have a way to do that per device. It's basically a username and password, some sort of key like that. But in our case, we do have a way of authentic, basically creating of this key exchange in such a way it is limited per device. And also what we do is we abstract it such that the device doesn't even know its MAC address. All it knows is a key. So it gets a key and says, all right, I'm requesting my location based upon a key. So it limits that. Also, it limits the scope of the queries. So with normal REST APIs, when you do them, you're basically opening up the amount of REST API queries you can do. So they could query for analytics, they could query for other information you may not want them to do. So basically we've limited it such a way that it's limited to that. Now, <clears throat> IP address, how would you query? IP address will not work. So if you did your own REST APIs and you say, all right, I know my IP address, I'll do that. That's not true. With larger venues across multiple buildings, IP address can be the same across that. So if you're a large store or some retail across different West Coast and East Coast and different things like that, the IP addresses won't be unique. So, and then the other thing is by using IP address, now you're forcing them to join. So where in our case is you don't necessarily have to join. Again, we can see your location by the probes. And then again, MAC address is not determined by uh, on iOS devices. So now you run into the issue with there. You have to try and build up all that technology we built into R. So that's why we recommend using the SDK. Uh, the mobile app server is an RPM. It's designed to run pretty much on any Linux system. It receives notifications. The minimum requirement is eight gig for 5,000 active users. So active meaning 5,000 people with their apps open doing requests for location. So it doesn't mean just 5,000 only. It means actually actively trying to track their 5,000 of them at the time. And that's on the smaller dual core kind of system. So it can be obviously scaled up a lot easier with a bigger system. Um, it has diagnostic commands and so forth. Um, the installation is pretty straightforward, your typical RPMs. Um, to set it up, it's real straightforward, just a username, password to get it going. And again, the development kit we give out, which is on DevNet, is, uh, we have an Android, we give a sample app, same with the iOS, sample app, and then there is a simulator you can run on your local desktop, it's a Node.js. Capabilities, sort of gone into it somewhat. Uh, X, Y, if we do have longitude, latitude, we can get that. We, we do have a map view if you want to leverage that. We do have indoor wayfinding, so you can say, all right, I want to get to this particular point of interest. We'll determine the wayfinding to that. We have push notifications, and then you can actually join the Wi-Fi as well if we have ways of basically assisting with the Wi-Fi joining. Yes. Oh, so the question was, how do you do wayfinding with walls and so forth? So the way you do it is, is we don't, some try and determine the walls and everything probably. What we do is, as part of the admin function, is you actually draw the roads in essence. And we do shortest path based upon that. So we've looked at trying to do this, looking at it and stuff, but then with text and other things, it makes it real difficult. Um, the more the questions usually we get is, uh, I have certain routes I want to use for certain people and certain routes for other people. We will, I mean, it's something we don't have yet either there. Uh, the development kit, like I said, we, get, we, we provide a simulator. 
Uh, now the issue with the development kit is somewhat constrained. Um, we have some maps in it. We don't really have any ways to extend those maps. Um, it tends to walk a predefined route is one way it runs. The other way it runs is you can click on different points and have the dot move yourself. Um, the routes are simulated. Uh, this is basically the support. We support iOS 6 and above, Android 2, 3 and higher. Uh, again, this is to show you what the simulator does. The line doesn't exist here. I'm just sort of, when I drew the line here, it's just to show you what the route would be like. And what happens is when it reaches the end of the route, basically the dot starts over and repeats the route again. But it's a nice way to test out the app to see if it's working like you expect. The simulator sort of straightforward. Uh, Android, I'll go through that quickly, is basically Android Studio. You can basically import it. These are some of the permissions we require as a result of basically being in Android Studio. Uh, the biggest, obviously, is the Wi-Fi, find location, and so forth. Um, how do you get it? Like I said, it's really simple to do from, a, from the SDK perspective. So in this case, I'm just trying to get the X and Y. I don't need the maps or anything like that, so I'm just trying to get that. So basically, all I have to do is do initialization. There's a set configuration parameter, and in that configuration, basically, you're defining basically which server to talk to on which port, and that's a, basically almost that's it. And then I can start the polling. And then every so often I can tell it what's the update interval I want the polling to continue at. And then it'll return the updates as they come in. And then basically I can then parse that information out. So in this case, I'm parsing out the X, the Y. I didn't put the launch lat, but I just want to show you could. And then even the zone name. So if you've defined zones, I can get that, we can pull that information in as well. So the map view, you can basically, there is a way to do it that can start it easily. If you want us to take full control, so I can do a show map view. In this case, basically, I've simulated that. So in this case, this is part of our sample code. We give you a sample app that will show you all this information. So you can take that sample code, run it, point it to the server, and have it start going. It does receive push notifications. And in our map view, you can see we have floor, we can see the floor, you can do a search for a point of interest. These square boxes are just the points of interest we happen to push in there. You can upload your own icons, basically. There's banner capabilities as well, such that as I enter a zone, the, the banner can change. And then here goes a, a, a look, basically a route. In this case, I've got a, this is sort of a dirty map but it basically will show you basically the route we've defined there. Again, slide out menu and you can pick the different buildings, the different floors, the different, all that can all be done there. Settings can be done from there. The search is your typical search capabilities which will then take you to a point of interest. And again, the sample app, again, has a map button. So again, it'll show, you can get the raw textual information or you can click on the map which will take you to that. Now the iOS SDK, why don't you go ahead and start. So uh, I'll give a demo for the iOS SDK.
coming up for some reason. It just froze. Oh, interesting. There we go. So it's your extended. So what, uh, what Harvey just mentioned that uh, we have a server simulator uh, which simulates the MSC. So that is the simulator which I'll be running, running now. So if you look at the simulator, uh, it is listening on port 8082, and this is the port where I'll be connecting my application to. So this is the actual application code which we give out on DevNet. This is iOS application code. And uh, if you look at the application code, I am basically asking the application to connect to port 8082 on my device. And this is the CMX framework or the CMX SDK which is there inside my application. Now as soon as I run my application, what I will see is that I am getting my XY coordinates which are simulated from the server. So basically I know on which zone, so I have the zone ID and I have the XY coordinates. So I know exactly where on the floor on the zone am I located. Now if I click on the map button here, you see, I have retrieved the image of the floor. And because I know the xy coordinates, I place the blue dot there. So now you will see that the blue dot is moving. So it basically moves in a specific pattern, which is set in the simulator. But if you think, if you replace the simulator with the mobile app server or the MSC, it will basically give you an actual location on the floor. So it will basically tell you exactly where on the floor you are. And you can basically create an application similar to this with using the CMX SDK. You'll also see there is a banner at the bottom, which is basically an advertisement which is associated with the zone. You can basically say that this, if a person is in this zone, this is the advertisement you want to display. Similarly, what you can add is, say, points of interest, which may be restrooms on the floor. So you can add restrooms, and you can say that I want to route from my location to the restroom. So it will immediately show what is the shortest path from your location to the restroom or any other point of interest. So I'll give you, uh, I'll just take you through the code a little bit about how it is functioning. So there are three, three steps involved here. The first step is initialization. So here I'm basically asking the CMX client to connect to the base server URL, which is on, basically I'm asking the client to connect to the uh, server. The next step is registration. So basically all I'm saying is that now connect with the server and register to the server. What it basically does, it exchanges a token, and it ensures a secure connection between the client and the server. So first step, I told the client that this is the server you need to connect to. Second step, I told the client that you need to register with the server, so that now it is a secure uh, token exchange. And after that, I am basically telling the client to load its location. So after that, I am getting the XY location from the server every five seconds, and I am updating it on the map. So this is what is happening uh, at the back end. So this is all there is to developing an application with the CMX SDK. Once you have your infrastructure set up, uh, this is all you need to do. All this code is available for free on DevNet. And our framework is also available on DevNet. So you can use our framework and play with the sample code. So I'll give it back to Harvey.
by use cases. Yeah, thank you. So I want to go over some of the use cases we've done. So <clears throat> you've seen some of them here, but we've actually, what we've done is we've created uh, use cases and we have a customer experience lab. So we actually created a lab. We're actually starting to show this in the lab for real. And in our lab, what we've done is we've created four verticals. We have a banking, hospitality, retail, and healthcare. So we created, we separated these into verticals, and we've created actual live demoable use cases to the customers. So the customers can come in. Not only they'll see these presentations, but we can actually then take them through and see it in real action. So. What are the use cases that we've done? So some of them are pretty fairly basic, but gives them still an idea of what you can do with location. So for example, in the banking, we have ways of changing signage. So basically based upon specific users, we can actually then interact with the environment. So even though we're getting location information, that location information then can use, be used to control the environment around you. Now it can be controlled based upon specific users and devices, or if you want, you can do analytics and do more analytical type of signage. Um, and then one of those I'll go through a little bit later. But for example, one of the things you can do is VIP. In fact, uh, meet the uh, engineers, for example, downstairs. They actually have ways of showing you where the engineers that you might meet are and, and then how to interact with them. So as you come in to meet the engineers, they'll actually be notified of that right away. So it's a way of basically meeting your customer at the door as quickly as possible. So that them having to find you, now you can interact with them directly. Then also is, not only can you do that, now you can actually bring up information about the customer. As soon as they come in, I have information about the device, the user, and I can bring up that information and then be able to interact with them a lot easier. Hospitality is the other one. And again, this is basically, again, Wi-Fi, push to the mobile devices. Uh, it creates a guest experience. So again, we demonstrate our guest access. This is a way, basically, of seeing them and having to join our guest access. So all that can do through that. We actually then can also show BLE and video analytics. So CMX is not only just going to be a Wi-Fi, per se, input. It actually can use video as well. So we can see counts as people come in and out of a venue. Uh, retail is the other one. And in retail, again, this is sort of where you, we've interacted. We use BLE a little bit more because we have customers that want to use BLE in some respects. So we have BLE detection. We actually know where those BLE devices are. So that's another source of input that the users can use because now I know their location of the devices and then again I can do signage change and also in here is staffing so this is where the analytics comes in I know which devices basically may be my customers but I also know which devices are my employees so then I can see that in a particular zone I may not have the headcount I need to cover that area so then I can do is basically send out a summons and have basically employees come in and help to assist in that area. So again, we can leverage the analytics and basically there. Then also we can do other things. We show examples of checking out. And again, we have BLE there where we can basically touch particular shirts, check them in, add them to a box, check out, all that information. Then I can, you can be notified of the checkout. We know where you are and so forth. Healthcare. Now, healthcare is another one we do. And again, with this one, we do a number of things. We actually can control the lights. So, what we do demonstrate in this area is patient comes in, they have a special mood lighting they like. We start out usually with the blue light. They're nice and comfortable. Then the doctor comes in. The lighting is automatically changed because, again, we know the device belongs to the doctor. So, we go from a mood lighting to a lighting that the doctor then can interact with the patient with. So it's a nice bright atmosphere. And again, you can bring up information about that. Again, we know that the doctor's there. But another one we do is sort of an IoT kind of technology is sanitizing the hands is actually a big thing with doctors and hospitals. We can actually tell if the doctor is approaching the patient before washing their hands. And then we've actually built an app to say, no, no, no. You can't do that. We, we buzz them and say no. So they actually have to go to the hand pump use the hand pump first 
after using the hand pump, then they can approach the patient. It's actually a bigger thing than you know. Question. Do you do the in the hand pump or do you do it through the BLE? So right now we do it through BLE. We could actually do it through IoT as well because the IoT device would notify us and we would know it either way. So either method would really work because we do know the position of the doctor relative to the hand pump in that case. We can do it through BLE, which means then the, uh, the, the Apple, the, the device then becomes sort of our sensor in that case. Yes, so there's a what there we do have sensors in the pumps like that. And that's actually how we sort of do it now. The BLE sensor turns on when they push the pump and then off when it triggers out. Um, and that's basically all the use cases I wanted there to mention. And that's basically all we have. Any further questions? All right. Thank you for your time.